Hello, everyone, and welcome to D-Web Decoded, which is uh, a podcast that you can see, which I guess is a thing these days. Um, we uh, look into the parts of Web3 and the decentralized web um, that we find super interesting from the uh, vantage point high up of uh, the Filecoin Foundation and the Filecoin Foundation for the Decentralized Web, uh, where we work to try and uh, help the whole ecosystem and kind of get away from the centralized uh, crystal castles, castles of doom. Yeah, I'm going to use that again. I'm joined um, today with actually a group of people that I'm, I, I, I've been tracking kind of individually and uh, collectively um, for, for some time. Uh, they're one of the organizations that we support at FFDW, um, but they, they span a whole range of tooling um, and approaches and, in fact, writing about how to achieve not only the kind of technical side of the decentralization program, but also kind of the social side that goes along with that. So without further ado, let me introduce you to the um, many members uh, that I have here of the distributed press um, community. Um, uh, there's Move. I don't know where I'm pointing to. You probably don't <laughs> see the same thing. Uh, that's Move. Uh, Move is a decentralized software consultant who's worked on local mesh networks, local first file transfer apps, a decentralized uh, web browser. That's Aggregor, right? Yeah. Yes, yes. And peer-to-peer uh, -peer virtual reality projects. They are the lead proco protocol engineer on distributed press, which we will find out more about in a moment, and a probationary member of the Haifa Worker Co-op. I've never met like a, a, a probationary period that I haven't wanted to immediately uh, resign from, but uh, <laughs> it's working out for you, Mo. Um, good. Okay, uh, we also, with Jackie Zhao, uh, who uh, also works with HIFAR on distributed press and is a core contributor at Versus, that's versus.xyz, if you are, I don't know, trying to click on the transcript here. And in his spare time, he maintains the open source mm -hmm. libraries like uh, Quartz, not the, the Mac. No, no. Okay. Um, uh, there will be a link to the <laughs> GitHub repo. Uh, it, it's basically a really good tool that enables you to publish your notes as a complete website and link to other people's uh, guns too. And finally, we have Falno, uh, who is a giant uh, square black blob, unless we've done something in post-production that uh, lets you uh, see him. Uh, Falno is a co-founder and member of the Sati, Sati Worker Co-op, uh, sati.nl, uh, which is based, surprisingly, given the .nl um, uh, top-level domain, in Buenos Aires. Sati is also the name of their platform that enables anybody to host and update resilient static websites uh, uh, built on, on Jekyll, the other pretty well-known static uh, uh, website tool. Okay, that was a lot, um, uh, and you have all done a lot, but Mauve, I'm going to pick on you to explain how you will, the thing you're all working on together, which is probably the heart of it is distributed press. Is that right? Yeah. So we're all working together um, on this tool and I guess stuff around this tool called distributed press. And the TLDR is it's like the printing press, but for decentralized data transfer. So the idea is you have a blog or some sort of like news or uh, personal site or web app, whatever, you want to get it published out on the decentralized web. And right now there's a whole bunch of different things that are the decentralized web. And it's kind of complex to set up all of the moving parts. What distributed press lets you do is you can take all of your files, send them to us in a tarball, and we'll publish it across IPFS, Hypercore Protocol, and BitTorrent. BitTorrent stuff where still ironing out some of the performance bits. But the idea is that longer term, if you want to get it out on any protocols, we'll just have a nice, simple interface. Um, on top of that, though, we're also working on making it easier to do social stuff on top of peer-to-peer -peer protocols with this new feature we're coming out with called the Distributed Press Social Inbox, just kind of like an email inbox, but for social data based on the ActivityPub protocol. Um, from Mastodon or Pixelfet or the such. Wow. Wow. <laughs> yeah. It's 
kind of like if your website had a there's so package. much to <laughs> unpack usually i'm like sitting there going okay now we could ask about this and now i'm in this sort of like muadib like branching history where i'm like going but i want to talk about all of these things <laughs> um uh, uh jackie which part of this do you do you try and concentrate on um <laughs> There's a lot. Um, I mostly do uh, the, the back end and infrastructure stuff um, for the distributed press project. So architecting the actual API, data storage stuff, um, and making sure that we have like a good and clean base to build off of for a lot of the protocol stuff. I also, um, some of the more technical details of uh, distributed press involve like running a DNS server to help resolve some protocol specific things like DNS link, which allow you to point specific protocol specific addresses uh, right. at, at a website um, and result in that way. So um, maintaining some of the infrastructure on that side um, and helping move. And, uh, and Fano, like one of the reasons why we ended up supporting distributed press that we were super excited about is that um, it's pretty easy and I'm not going to point any fingers, but it's pretty easy to go, you know what I'm going to do? I'm going to build a distributed peer to peer system and I'm going to write it um, and I'm not going to like have any users <laughs> I'm, gonna, like, <laughs> I'm just gonna like make the purest thing and the great thing about distributed press is that you work with and really integrate people who actually whose job is to publish stuff and that's what Sadi does so Fano maybe you could talk a little bit about what um what role Sadi had kind of before distributed press and how you're you're using it um, yeah, sure. Um, what we've been doing with Suti and, and before Suti for a, for a long time is that we work with uh, organizations like NGOs or grassroots, grassroots activist organizations on hosting their websites. Uh, what we realized before starting Suti and what we compelled us to to do it, to do it is that the, most of the platforms and the software we we've been using was pretty precarious, and that in that it needs lots of maintenance and and, and attentions just to be working right. So and most organizations don't have the budget for that. So when you build a website, you expect it to run for, for you want it to run forever, but it needs much work be behind that. So what we try to do at Suti, and we've been focusing on in the last five years uh, that Suti exists, is that we can build, we can actually build websites uh, for the people we want to work with. Uh, we work with. So that's my cat trying to join the conversation. Um, <laughs> what was I saying? Sorry. <coughs> Is uh, yeah that we technically we can build websites that last forever, right? Uh, and what we needed was a, a CMS that uh, work with them. And at, the mo at that moment, we didn't find the many options. There are many options for static site CMSs now. Uh, but part of the work we do in in Buenos Aires and across Latin America is that we also want to be the um, worker owners of the platforms and the software we built. So uh, we took the opportunity to, to build it ourselves, to Im Im imbue it with our own perspectives and, and the needs we we found with uh, uh, our, our colleagues and the organizations we 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 work with, uh, and that's how we started Suti. Um, and Suti is also a worker on cooperatives, so um, the all of the members of of the Suti Co-op are worker on owners of the of the cooperative. Um, that that was a bit total issue, Sorry. Um, no, no. But I, yeah, I the idea. Yeah. yeah. Sorry. I think it's interesting, and we we should we should set aside a chunk just to talk about the um, the. The fact that the Sudi is a cooperative, um, and so is Haifa, which is, I think, like you know, one of the the core parts of the people working on distributed press. 
Um, the bit that interests me, I uh, sort of just hearing you all talk about like your different roles is I think we often have this idea with decentralized or, or especially peer to peer programs that it's just, you know, it's just you <laughs> and like you're running your node, um, and, uh, study is a service for, for primarily or often NGOs, nonprofits. And I remember there was a time where people were very like, okay, nonprofits can often be targeted um, by governments. And so it would be really important for them to like run their own resources so that they have control over it. Um, but that's kind of a burden, right? So Fano, do you, what, what part of the burden do you take off um, off your your users do they end up designing the website and you just host it or are you um are you sort of designing their web pages too uh yeah we actually do a bit of um everything uh we we don't do we currently don't do the design but we work with another worker on cooperative that does the design oh. so what we the work we do and what supports, um, uh, what has supported Suti's work, is that we, um, uh, what's the word? A company? No. Well, we we we, we worked with the NGO from the design and and the the communication strategy, uh, the migration if they already have. Uh, content published on their own websites. Um, we build this on on Shaky, as you mentioned, and then they can manage the content through through Suti. So we 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 work we work with the with any organization that uh, all along the way of thinking about the website they they need and they and they want, and then how we can build it with more resilient technologies and then now that they, that we're working with distributed press we can also say well this is hosted on our servers but it can also be hosted anywhere and, and other organizations and individuals can help us to uh, host the, web, the websites and, and fulfill this this promise that they are uh, once they're published they are up forever right. So, move like this is this sort of how your team uh, sort of anticipates distributed press being used, like a kind of organization like study that sort of occupies that bit in the in the ecosystem of like someone who hosts WordPress sites or something like that, um, and they will have like they will use distributed press to like post this to the D web. Yeah, so we're actually figuring out the details of what our long-term strategy is. And right now, the way it works is you can self-host an instance of distributed press and just get it up um, on whatever infrastructure you control. And so self-hosting is super easy, and we want to make sure that since it's open source, it should be easy to adopt without having to like go through any extra steps. However, we are also forming relationships with groups interested in publishing their sites. And longer term, we've been talking about maybe doing some sort of co cooperative governance and ownership of the distributed press infrastructure itself, so that the stakeholders, be it large publishers or smart, small publishers, could potentially work t uh, together. Personally, I see distributed press as a piece of this larger picture of how are we going to use this decentralized software at all. Because right now, <laughs> we have, um, we have useful tools like Filecoin, where we can onboard a huge amount of data and pin it and just have it available for a long time. There's a whole bunch of things around the, the ecosystem of how to get the data back out or upload it in there. And there's various versions of that. But then how does this look for, say, a small, like just a uh, community organized group? Or right. how do they then read that data back? Or is there a way to make it so that we don't even need to de uh, depend on any extra infrastructure to make it work? Distributed press is a bridge to get data onboarded easily, but it's one piece of this larger whole. 
of where eventually maybe we don't even need distributed press to be the way people publish. Maybe it's a way you can get more um, groups to publish like from their existing workflows or whatever else. Right. Yeah, so right now we're starting small, building community, building these relationships, and then we're gonna grow from there and work with other components to make like a more holistic stack. Right. I wanna kind of add onto that and just like think about peer-to-peer -peer even just like as a term. Um, it's like individual, individual to individual, but uh, I think a bigger question that has kind of surfaced in, in like the Web3, I guess, decentralized tech sphere is like most people don't actually really want to host their own infrastructure and actually hosting right. their infrastructure is really hard. Um, so it's a lot of what we're, we've been kind of thinking about um, with, especially like in the context of cooperatives is like, what does communally owned infrastructure look like? Um, and having groups larger than just individuals being able to kind of contribute and right. post content for each other. Um, at least to me, kind of like publishing with DWeb means that instead of like a single provider hosting your content, you have a bunch of people on the web that are helping co-host your content as well. And very much right. Like, you know, I, I think this is really um, interesting in that that we're very used to very clearly demarcated perimeters around organizations. You know, I work for the man. They're a very nice man. Um, but but you know that's that's my full time <laughs> job. I mean, I have a few other hats, right? Like you know, I post to my own blog and like I tweet my name, or you know, I'm contributing to these other groups, and those are more permeable. I think part of, I think what's interesting, and this is a theme going through um, these podcasts, is like you know, talking about other ways that people organize. Like, so I think it was interesting when Fauno said, well, we do this bit and there's another cooperative that does this other bit. Um, and with cooperatives, there's sort of this overlapping part. Like, Zao, like, how do you, um, ja sorry, Jackie, I've just, <laughs> surname, like, kind of, but anyway, um, how do you, um, uh, this work that you're doing with this, how do you fit it in with like other other work? Are you kind of, do you see yourself as a, a contractor? Is it just another sort of open source program that you contribute to? Um, how do you divide your time? I, I'm sorry. Yeah, I jumped into it. I'm and, sorry. And think, like, uh, you know. <laughs> <laughs> no, no, no this is, this is, it's good and worth asking. And I think it's, it's really interesting, that especially in the sphere of like how people la label themselves or introduce themselves, I think historically I've actually like really disliked introductions because it kind of forces you to flatten yourself into like a very legible uh, like paragraph form. And I think most people are, are much more than you know what a paragraph could describe. Uh, and I think similarly with like organizational affiliations, like people's identities are, are pluriversal and, and have multiple right. facets to them. And, um, it's like a lot of a lot of it is like it's very hard to find like a single company or a single organization to be able to kind of encapsulate that entire entire part of it. Um, and so I think the the larger like upshot here is like people need to be part of different communities um, and different bodies of work. Um, and a lot of times that's actually ends up being really helpful because then you get a lot of crossover and cross pollination between different projects and ideas. But like, hey, well, I've done this really cool thing with this project already. Um, would be cool to contribute something similar to this other project. And I think that sort of cross-pollination is what allows, what allows you to kind of break down um, like more traditional barriers about like, oh, this is like a company that does this exclusive thing, or this is a project that's only for this. I think a lot of the like, real innovations kind of come from cross-disciplinary or, or these sort of like, right. cross Mo, do you are you still working? On, is Aggregor still, um, still proceeding? Yeah, so that's one of the things, kind of like going off of what Jackie said, a lot of the folks working on distributed press are actually wearing a whole bunch of hats in addition right. to distributed press. Like um, our project manager, um, I don't know what roles everyone has, uh, Mai Shikawa Sutton. So they are also doing a lot of D-Web related stuff and right. they've been kind of in the ecosystem doing like a whole bunch of things at once. And so their experience with other teams and the crosstalk has been really helpful, as well as other members of uh, Haifa that are like jumping in and out of distributed press work. We're all kind of working on a bunch of things. And as such, we're kind of like spreading as a sort of a mycelium, connecting a whole bunch of things together. 
And so, right. yeah, pers- rhizomatic pers- is the you know. Yeah. It has been ten minutes since we started <laughs> talking, and we've we've just hit the rhizomatic um, uh, point. Yeah. Yeah. Um, but re- re- regarding um, Agrigor itself, I use it full time. Um, I would have joined this call on it um, if it presented itself as being more Chrome-like. For I know. The- <laughs> there's, a, there's always a point in these discussions where someone will go, and if we were actually using a bit more of this decentralized software, I wouldn't have had so much trouble like joining it. At least it's better than when we were on Twitter Spaces. But anyway, yeah. yeah okay. Yeah, so yeah. yeah. But but Agrigor, it like it works. It's great, right? And it yeah. supports all of these protocols. So. Um, yeah. So I find it to be an important part for the viewing side of like, okay, we've published, now what? And the now what I think is we should be encouraging peer-to-peer web browsers. Um, right now, Agrigor is, you know, an electron-based desktop app and also a Chromium-based um, Android app. And so you can access IPFS in both uh, places, but there's also other browsers like Brave has IPFS integration. There's Capulun, which is a whole new... Uh, mobile operating system. There's this. Mm-hmm. Uh, we're gonna oh, get. Yeah, we're gonna it? get the Capaloon. Excellent. On, yeah, for, I, for I Reese's hope work, soon. super exciting. I'm it really is. I'm waiting to install it on like my Pine phone or something. Once I get it, I have my Pine phone in the drawer, ready. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah. So Agrigor, we are actually we have enough um, a Filecoin grant that we're slowly working through, where we're making some. Uh, tutorials and example apps so that folks interested in getting into peer-to-peer web apps um, can kind of follow along with these. We just publish our first set of tutorials and apps on the website. So if you go to agrigor.mov.moe, um, there's stuff there on the blog. Uh, but it's definitely uh, not my primary thing right now compared to distributed press. <laughs> mm-hmm. So, uh, but but uh, again, like I think this is the theme, right? So we have this whole pipeline, right? So uh, Fauno is doing the kind of pub- the traditional sort of publishing role, or I guess hosting, but a little bit more. Um, Mo, you you your background is like the browser that somebody looks at this through. Jackie, you're doing kind of the infrastructure side of things, but the other part of distributed press is also that there's a test publication, right? There's compost. Are you, any of you working on compost or am I, is this my opportunity to get two, two podcasts out of the same group? Um, well, compost is primarily run by my, so they'd right. be the best person to talk about it. Um, we've mostly helped on the infrastructure side. So when issue three was being released, we helped update all of the old issues to the latest version of distributed press. And also, once we release the new social inbox, we're going to be working with the compost side um, to update it with the new social features. Nice. But com- so, com- so, go ahead. Oh, sorry. Fun, no, go ahead. No, we, we also um, turn um, the compost design into a theme. So if you create an account in, in Suti, you can have, you have a, a um, customizable, customizable compost uh, website, so anyone can yes. can you can also enable the the distributed press integration and publish it to to the web. So it's an aesthetic as well as a, a magazine, right? Yeah. So, and I, I won't, I, I'll drag my in to talk about this, but, but for those of you who want to see it, um, we'll throw the URL. I, it's compost dot digital. Digital. That's what I top level domains. Um, but if you, if you go there, it's actually a great little zine and it's sort of without doing that thing of going, Hey, this is, we're using this peer-to-peer network to talk about this peer-to-peer network. Find out more <laughs> by, um, uh, which is a recurring problem, I think, with new social media. Uh, it is about decentralization, but it actually manages to be actually pretty pretty diverse in the, in the stories it talks about. Um, but I want to kind of drill down on this for, with, with, with you all, really, which is so, okay. 
we have compost compost is a traditional website um and then you you said move like you tar up your files or you you know zip them up or you you put them into a form that that like you can send off to someone and then it appears on ipfs which i think our audience is probably pretty familiar with um but also a uh, more th more than just that, like maybe you can talk about what the others the others are. Yeah. So the other big one that we're using is called Hypercore Protocol. It's part of the Hole Punch um, ecosystem. Mm -hmm. So Hole Punch. It used uh, to be. Video. It used to be DAT, right? Yeah. Or it used DAT, to be DAT. Yeah. Then the core of like the peer to peer side of DAT got spun spun off into this other thing, and now the that has been integrated into this larger st stack called Hole Punch and this uh, decentralized chat app called Keat, keat.io, which is kind of using it. Oh, interesting. Um, this is also where the Beaker browser existed. Right. Um, sadly, Beaker hasn't been worked on in a few years. Um, on the positive side, because Paul Frazee, who did that, now does Blue Sky, right? Oh, yeah. So, yeah, yeah, yeah. So, anyway. Definitely. Ahead, like, Blue Sky stuff is also super exciting. I'm interested in seeing where we can overlap in the future. Um, but yeah, one of the cool things is adopting, uh, um, oh yeah, and then the other protocol that we support is BitTorrent. As I said before, we're ironing out some things. We're doing something fancy with BitTorrent uh, using this spec called mutable torrents. So right now, if you're used Ooh. to downloading BitTorrent stuff, like say your Linux ISOs or your um, copyright free, like Big Buck Bunny videos, um, you kind of download the torrent, and then if there's any updates or changes, you need to download a different torrent. Right. So there's this spec that's been out for like a long time now. <laughs> I was going to ask, right? Is this novel, new stuff or just unexplored stuff in the BitTorrent in yeah. the system? Yeah, so sadly it's ladder? very unexplored because there was a bit of a boom. I think this was like 2016, mm -hmm. something, something around there. Oh. So, I mean, I don't want to say recent, but maybe recent in the history of BitTorrent, because tor BitTorrent's been around since the 2000s, right? Yeah, so this was a boom around the time when WebTorrent came out. Um, mm -hmm. There was, like, a lot more attention on BitTorrent again. Sadly, it hasn't been... Well, WebTorrent is picking up again, but this mutable torrents thing hasn't really been focused. So yeah. we're trying to get that up and running and have, like, a easy-to-use example. So Aggregor can load mutable torrents. Uh, nice. LibTorrent, one of the most popular C++ libraries for BitTorrent, actually has support for it, but none of the clients that I'm aware of expose that. So we're right. hoping longer term, once we have these mutable torrents, more clients can start uh, adopting it. Um, but the reason we have these different protocols is that there's trade-offs between everything. And yeah. the trade-offs lie in performance, like update speed, ecosystem around it, programming language availability. There's a whole bunch of trade-offs in every single one. There's no like one protocol to rule them all. And what we're interested in exploring is making it easy to use all of these different protocols and kind of like play with the different trade-offs and play with the different ecosystems you can access. Um, if you go on the Haifa blog called Dripline, we actually have a series where we compare the trade-offs between all of these things. It's a three-parter. It's pretty big. Um, I think I just like cranked it out in eight hours and then we took months to revise it. But um, we kind of go in more depth there. Yeah, I, I find that, I mean, there are so many, I mean, of course, like I'm, you know, I have IPFS ta tattooed, like IPFS, IPNS. No, that would be a waste of fists. But, um, but you know, I'm, I'm, <laughs> right, I'm, 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 uh, uh, I, I'm super involved in that, but you know, and people are always like, "Oh, like are you in competition with these other things?" And and really, I mean, I don't want to over beautify. Of course, there's a little bit where you go, "Oh God," um, but in fact, you know, you you look at these, you you are always looking at these trade offs, and both kind of trying to see if they're the, so with BitTorrent. The great thing about BitTorrent, which I've envied for so much, and I wish we had more of in the IPFS system, is the fact that it's fast, right? It's like, it's it's faster than 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 the web for you know large files. That's its reason to exist, and it's funny that we could do that in IPFS, but we 
don't, right? Like there are multiple copies. Um, there's a really interesting project called Rapid, which is is attempting to do this. Um, and again, it's that thing where because people don't think of IPFS as being like BitTorrent, even if you get it to do that, it kind of, it doesn't languish, but it's not what people automatically think of. Like you say with mutable torrents, mm. and uh, I, I, so uh, Jackie, like you, sort of have to maintain the infrastructure of all of these things. So I feel like there's this slight burden on you to like, great. Now I have to support like three different protocols. Does the does the decentralized nature of that take a load off you or does that or is it actually kind of immediately compensated by having to deal with a much more complicated environment it's it's a mix of both <laughs> i think um yeah just the earlier point about like bit torrent stuff i think one of the really cool things is it has this like super linear property about like how the, if you have more peers that are participating it right. actually gets faster which is not the case for most like right. traditional web infrastructure and right now it's actually I don't think is the case for our, our like our our distributed press server itself, um, but there is like a lot of ways to architect protocols in a way that like enables that to happen. And Move actually has done a lot of really cool performance work on the uh, IPFS and Cubo side to make uh, like right. it actually just go really fast. Like our our sites publish um, end to end to IPFS and a bunch of other wow. things in less than five seconds, which is like almost unheard of for most other like. Um, yeah, it's like outside of <laughs> like this project. IPFS is like traditionally hey, for being, but yeah, well, no, but, it totally like uh, I mean, they, so, certainly the the build up <laughs> and you know I've done that footsing around with IPNS where you're kind of like, is it working? Is it is it is it doing it? And yeah, that's I mean, Mov and I have sort of spoken briefly about this where I'm going, oh, you made this really snappy, um, uh, but yeah. we won't tell the listeners how. <laughs> no, we should write a blog post, Mo. We should write about like because it's it's just it's just secret knowledge, right? In some ways, like and um, so, are you, are you, Jackie? Are you like, to, uh, do you feel that like you're in a unique position as a sort of like infrastructure person for a system where people believe that there is no infrastructure people, or is that another community that you're in? Yeah, they always say right. the cloud is. You are computer, that other computer. Right? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> um, yeah, at least within within Haifa, I'm lucky to have. There's like a lot of other folks who help run a lot of Haifa infrastructure. So we we do have like mm -hmm. Haifa owned infrastructure. Like we run our own IPFS and uh, Hyper gateways and uh, like nodes for that as well. So I'm lucky to have um, like Yurko and the other Hyper collaborative members. Of Correct me if I'm forgetting. Yeah, Elon as well, who not not Musk, <laughs> um, that help us maintain a lot of our uh, hyper site infrastructure as well. So it's it's right. very much like a communal thing of um, upholding infrastructure, and I'm very lucky to not have it be like a sole responsibility. So Fano, uh, <laughs> you obviously run a bunch of infrastructure at Sati. Um, are you do you do you have to like now start thinking about running at least? some distributed dweb nodes is that like an extra burden on you um well yeah we've been discussing about distributed infrastructure for many many years now my my first approach to to free software communities was around community networks and right that's, this right. was more than 15 years ago and we were we were discussing this this week uh, is that we um, believe our work the work we've been doing with the web and, and, and Suti in general is um, uh, framed in this uh, activism around Community media, community networks, uh, the right to to communication, to um, appropriating technology. So, when we look at how infrastructure is is deployed in Latin America, we see that uh, 
internet cables go instead of uh, we are in Argentina and then uh, to send a message message to 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 Chile even if we are using the web technologies it goes up to north sorry to Miami <laughs> then across the United States and then south again to to to, to the to the Pacific up, uh, up to Chile so um, it's uh, something we need we believe we need to discuss in this in this framing that Latin America infrastructure is so so centralized in, in the in the US and, and what to we be are yeah, sorry. To be clear, right, is that the literal kind of internet connectivity or is just that an artifact of using kind of cloud tech? Is it the, the like, would a peer-to-peer -peer system suffer from that same um, loop through through uh, the United States of America or, um, or is it yeah, just because of sort of the business model level? Um, no, I think we, we we may need to check the the maps, but there's uh, we've been investigating this. There was a, there was there were plans like ten years ago to to for for Chilean and Argentinian governments to do the 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 mounting of fiber optic network between the countries, for instance, and, and across some other countries, and we haven't heard of these plans. In the, in the last years so there's some advances on them um, um, that should come from public funding and then they they end up being from uh, uh, private funding so there's a cable that belongs to Google that goes to from Argentina right. to, to Uruguay I believe um, so yeah it's something that, that we need to 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 research further and, and, and keep discussing and, 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 and talk openly about, right? So uh, when we look at the web technologies, for us the framing is that, well, if we need to have our own infrastructure, why do we need to replicate the models that uh, right. produce centralization and, and and monopolies and uh, monocultures, cultivation of, of uh, computers, right? So uh, when we when we look at uh, the way we can start thinking, well, we can have uh, nodes nodes between other organizations. We can replicate information. We can make sure that the data uh, lives with us and is part of our or day-to-day -day operation and doesn't reside somewhere on the network on the on the cloud uh, so, this so this is this is, this is a, yeah. an aside but I do want to ask and it does have a connection so Sudi is based in Buenos Aires but as I said at the top of yeah. the show like you have a dot NL which is Netherlands <laughs> like yeah. of, why is that I always wanted to ask someone from Sudi and a public okay. podcast is the perfect moment I'm sure <laughs> yeah, sure. Uh, well, we uh, when we started, we didn't have that much money to run operations, um, and for for some time we 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 did self self funding. I like we apart we had some savings and we started working on that. Um, and if I remember correctly, we wanted to, to have a domain hosted by Niala, who are these nice folks who host or uh, who act as, as uh, domain registrars uh, who protect your identity on the, on the mm -hmm. internet. Um, uh, Argentinian domains, the .r, need your legal name on it on them. Oh so right, right. At that point, I, I believe it changed now, but at that point they published the who is database had your uh, your telephone number, your house address. Actually one time I had another domain and, and uh, a journalist called my my parents' house because it was <laughs> my house at the moment. 
<laughs> I, I, the, the registration and uh, it, they refer my 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 mom refer refer him to my my cell phone number. I suddenly was talking with someone I didn't know right. anything about because he wasn't the who is that who is that is publicly. So we didn't, we didn't want to start by registering. You didn't want your mom being called again, like. But presumably yeah. you trained well, her more in information security by then. So. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> but, um, um, yeah. Uh, yeah, that was surprising actually. But uh, well, and then um, the the cheapest domain names, the the one we we were, we wanted a short one. So the the NL one was the two letter two character TLD. So nice. that's the that is the story behind the SUTNL. But yeah, then so we realized it's confusing. Now we have a dot so com dot r that's uh, under the. Sooty worker on cop uh, name. Oh yeah, because there's a dot co op now, name. right? Right. Um, so I thought that was going to be a great segue to international cooperation, and it kind of is. Um, but it's also kind of a good segue to like explaining privacy issues around these protocols, right? Because I think sometimes people get sort of the censorship resilience part of the equation. Um, mixed up with the fact that actually, I mean, to pluck BitTorrent out, you know, BitTorrent is actually, and I think people know this now, can be very revealing about who is downloading and sharing this. Like when you are trying to describe this to people who are going to use this technology, how do you explain the privacy trade-offs with these different protocols? I'm going to pick on Mauve because <laughs> I'd, I'd also like to hear Fauno's approach because I think Sadi's oh, that's been true. talking a lot with uh, folks in there. Personally, um, I kind of think of the trade-offs because right now, um, what are you revealing and to who is a big question. Because uh, mm -hmm. even with BitTorrent, you know, you once you start downloading something and you start resharing to the network, your IP address can be leaked. And so other people downloading that content might be able to find out where your IP is and that could lead to um, them finding out which city you're in and like other scary things. Um, but also different protocols have different trade-offs. So for example, um, how can somebody find that you uh, are torrenting something? And so that's kind of a, a big question where if it's some sort of publicly available torrent, if it's a publicly known data set, there might be organizations that are constantly scanning the network and just trying to see who is and isn't downloading it. Um, in IPFS, for example, there's new things being introduced to make it a little bit harder to just like scrape, scrape all of the data that's available from the network by doing double hashing, or um, there's this new thing called, or no, not new thing, thing uh, called, uh, I think it was like relay something. But the idea is that instead of you connecting to the network directly, you connect through another node, which is closer to how Tor works. Right. And right. every, like every other month, someone comes in and is like, "When are you going to support Tor or I two P or w whatever else?" Right. Or there's right. new things being released that have mixed nets uh, built in. So it, like, one of the things is if you are replicating data that is within. A community that you trust, the risk is very low. Um, not very low, but it's much lower. Like maybe someone could man in the middle on your network connection and see that you're doing some sort of IPFS traffic. But right. unless they actually have those, um, have like the raw identifiers you're uh, replicating, they don't necessarily know what you're replicating. And as well, there's other things being uh, put into place where you can ask to download a bunch of different chunks from different peers at once to kind of like fuzz what in information you're actually interested in. Um, mm -hmm. There's a whole bunch of things being worked on to make the peer-to-peer -peer, uh, stuff a little bit more like private. This is also with trade-offs and it depends on your threat model. Personally, I think for the contexts where you're sharing data among uh, trusted peers, that's where you get the most advantage. And then for more public data is where it gets a little uh, more gray. Yeah. 
I think um, we we had a session on this at the web camp uh, this year earlier talking about like what is the meaning of deletion in like a decentralized world and a lot of the main question kind of revolved around like what deletion means when copying bytes is really cheap and can happen anywhere without consent like anywhere along the line of transfer um, and the kind of conclusion that we all came up with was that deletion can only happen in like non Byzantine environments where everyone what does kind of sorry what does Byzantine mean in this we, in this context yeah so Byzantine is like uh, a technical term uh, used to describe uh, a property called Byzantine fault tolerance, which is uh, referring to this uh, old distributed systems problem called the, the 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 Byzantine generals problem, in which like three military generals need to coordinate an attack on the city, but uh, they can't trust that the communication will always make it to the other peers without being altered. Uh, and the, the 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 result is that there's actually no way to coordinate. Um, among all three of them, such that they can always guarantee that two uh, generals attack at the same time. Um, so basically, saying that it's like without, um, um, if you have malicious actors uh, in, in this system, that it's uh, honestly very hard to uh, coordinate. Um, so, in, in the context of this deletion example, is that if you have a, even a single bad actor in a trusted group, you can't. Act, it's very hard to guarantee that any deletion will ever occur. Uh, the kind of like more common analogy that we kind of decided on was that deletion in like a decentralized context is more like whiteout than erasing in that you're like adding another layer on top of right. please ignore the previous thing but like a really motivated attacker can kind of go and scratch off that top layer of whiteout and, and look at that do people topic. still know what whiteout is or are we just like <laughs> we, it's, it's like it's that that weird thing where you try and explain it into a technology that people have used and like they go oh no we all use <laughs> tor now so you have to explain it to the tor. Yeah, 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 yeah 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 for the young folks out there you put a layer of white thing over the paper and you don't see the thing underneath. it's like over, over your vcr like no, VHS not VCR. <laughs> like if you were, oh no, Fano, um, do you have these conversations? Do you? I mean, some of the some of your customers must actually be thinking of, of threat models and their security. Um, do you help them think through these problems? Yeah, um, the the attacks we we've been seeing. Uh, the, well, uh, in, in Argentina, what actually happened with some other projects is that the um, or there are servers, issues, or um, domain blocks at the DNS. So the 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 judge orders the the uh, internet providers to block the the DNS. So we when we started thinking on Suti and what uh, we need to support to, 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 to be resilient through these cases is that, well, since there are static websites are just a folder full of files, we can copy them anywhere, we can host them, host them under any domain name. We've been looking at, at different technologies to, to do this, so the, the um, the the uh, way we uh, work through this is that well the, the website can be hosted anywhere so even if we are blocked or our servers are, are exist the websites can also can also exist um, somewhere else um, and then we don't collect information on our visitors we have visitor logs but we don't record personal information uh, the the SUTI CMS doesn't require any personal information for you to register so if you don't uh, well you can you could use you could use uh, the SUTI CMS with a, a pseudonym or an anonymous account and as right. long as it follows our terms of service that uh, say any website is welcome uh, but don't don't host hate speech here you can host 
create speech on, on, on through our CMS, uh, it, it should be fine. Um, but even those are for us. Those are the censorship is the, like the 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 extreme case. What usually happens is that if you don't update your website regularly or do backups or stuff like that somewhere along the line you will be infected by some malware and then you will be uh, your search results will give um, uh, spam to to your visitors and then uh, search engines will deprioritize right. uh, your site from the results so you become invisible even if you haven't been censored um, yeah. that's for us the main issue for the for the organizations we work with is that we need to be organizations need to be behind maintenance updates CEO uh, uh, SEO sorry um, um, many stuff just to be visible in the in the in the web yeah. and doesn't this entail doesn't I will entail censorship it's just precarious yeah. It's often, I think often when we're in this sort of space, we come up with these very elaborate kind of, oh, you know, what happens if the government comes along? Um, and in fact, you know, the biggest problems anyone struggles with are the same ones anybody else does, which is like you say, you're, you know, the malware isn't there to get your precious secrets. The malware is there to fill your site up with spam and that means no one sees your site because because like yeah. you say uh, Google deprioritizes it that said um, I'm just sort of looking at what happened to Collectiva which is uh, a anarchist run um, uh, Mastodon server that was seized by the FBI and I think um, Jackie I mean not not pointing the FBI in your direction, but but is that one of the things <laughs> that you you think about, right? Like you know that people often come to the decentralized web because they have these very um, different threat models, right? They're worried, perhaps they're you know a whistleblower who's whistleblowing on Google, so obviously they don't want to store their stuff on Google, but that means that you you know when there are single points of failure like like um you know uh, study hosting something or you being the dns do you are you comfortable occupying that role or are you always looking to distribute it even further yeah i think this is a really hard problem and it uh kind of comes down to like what people feel the role of infrastructure providers uh, ends up serving it's like whether infrastructure providers or content providers uh, should should be responsible for the actual content or infrastructure or like mm -hmm. applications that are hosted on top of them like there's a, a lot of like many past case examples of this uh like uh, kiwi farms was one of them that was like was running on aws and then uh aws made the decision to shut it down even, um, even though they were you know supposed to be like a neutral infrastructure layer uh, they still had tos that they decided to uphold um, similarly, or I guess another example is like when um, I think the government was asking for a backdoor into Signal. Um, they were like, "Yeah, we're happy to give you everything, right, that, but right, we actually have nothing because of how yeah. we've done our privacy thing." Which is like another way of doing it. Which is like one is like, um, well, the first question is like whether infrastructure companies or organizations that host infrastructure have the responsibility to be responsible to to have the power to take down content from the platform? Or or can you even actually subvert that at a deeper technical level by making sure that that's actually never your responsibility in the first place? Uh, and I think a lot of decentralized applications kind of lean in the second direction where it's like the, the decentralization kind of diffuses this responsibility in a way that it actually uh, makes it uh, nigh impossible to kind of like either from a privacy perspective recover that information um, or just like or, no or way to kind of I mean, the way I tend to think about it is that it focuses the responsibility on the people actually doing the thing, right? Like, I feel like sometimes people feel that stopping bad speech consists primarily of um, uh, ignoring it, 
Right, like, like you know, that 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 you can go. Oh, don't worry, we've taken this person off the internet, and you're going. You know, they're still out there. Right, <laughs> like they're not. They're not like you haven't by making everybody not see it, and that may have some some positive effects. Right, it's it, it, it's hard to tell, but it's not solved the fundamental problem. And you know, for everybody who's sort of using Google as a way to contest or shape the public discussion, there's always somewhere, you know, there's always, that's all, that's still going on somewhere that's reflecting a, um, a structural yeah. problem in society. Yeah. I guess my, my challenge question back to that is like, is there a real way to actually prevent that? I guess like given the nature of how permissionless the web is, it's like there's, I guess it's very difficult, if not impossible to prevent this. Problem. Right, right, right. Which means you have to kind of tackle the underlying problem, right? I think that's, I'm, yeah. you know, I think that, that as, as people get more powerful, right, or, or use technology to become more powerful, then um, they become some, like, you don't know where that power is going to go. And you don't know how that power will be used against other people. And there's definitely a sense in which, you know, we're building, you're all building this amazing infrastructure, um, uh, but you're trying to build it in a way that distributes the power, right? Rather than taking it for yourself, I hope. Um, and I don't, I, I, do you, how, how do you, Mo, what is your sort of view of where, distributed press should be in like two years time. I mean, like, do you want everybody to be using it? Do you want it to exist in communities that are close to you, like Suddy, like Compost? Is that a success? Do you, um, do you want it to stay aligned with the people whose values you share? Or are you happy to, if, if it was used by the whole world? I mean, Happier. I... I think realistically, the whole world adopting distributed press specifically is not going to happen in two years. Right. And I, I like the condition of like, not in two years, maybe three max. Well, like, as I mentioned before, distributed press is also just a piece of this like whole ecosystem we're working within. And personally, I think there's a category of people for whom distributed press and study is like the easiest way to onboard onto this. I, it's almost like a gateway drug where it's like, oh, wow, we've published on the D-Web. But then it's right. like, what if you published on the D-Web without servers? Or what if you publish interactive stuff on the D-Web? Or like, we've got web content, but now we have distributed peer-to-peer -peer databases. And it's like, what can we do with that? Or it's like, we're integrating with ActivityPub and all the decentralization happening on the Fediverse. But now we're like, oh, what if also we have uh, Fediverse clients that speak peer-to-peer -peer activity pub from the get-go. Like, I, I see distributed press as, again, like, it is part of the big picture. Um, but on top of that, I, I do very much value growing as a community and building up community. I'm not a huge fan of the, I guess, kind of like, traditional software um, model right now where people basically make something that will solve an issue for folks and they get a bunch of VC funding to dump into marketing, spread as much as they can and like get as many ads in people's faces and people's using it. And then now they have a monopoly and they start crunching and adding ads or like raising prices or, you know, out competing smaller things and like kicking them out. I'm not a huge fan of that approach. And that approach is the best way to get everyone using the thing in two <laughs> years. So I think what is more likely to happen is we're gonna slowly grow with people that are values aligned that um, kind of believe in this stuff we want. Like, I think one thing this gets to is like, who is this useful to right now? Because personally, I think people that have, um, let's say like wealth, access to stable internet, access to like, resources and knowledge and all of that through just the traditional means, they're not going to benefit that much from um, decentralized software. But I think places like, say, um, groups that, say, uh, have less of the privilege of <laughs> the way um, capitalism is structured, that's where uh, they can m make use of more of it. Like, what if instead of having to set up 
really expensive data, uh, data centers in order to work in a community, what if the community becomes your data center and becomes your infrastructure? These are the places where like decentralized software and distributed press and everything else kind of like do something that you can't do with the cloud right now. Um, and I think those are the people that would be useful to work with first or in tandem. Like, uh, I think one thing though is there is maybe some interest for groups to use distributed press from like a more traditional um, enterprise place where it's like, you know, we kind of want to publish to this thing. Maybe they're getting tired of uh, Facebook or Meta's monopoly on who gets to see their data or say um, they had Twitter, now they don't, and suddenly they can't get their news out to their audience or can't get emergency broadcasts out. This is where the um, activity pub social inbox thing we're doing can be very useful, where we can make it easier for organizations and communities to own their data, own their infrastructure, but then still transact with the world at large instead of um, just these corporate silos. <laughs> I don't know if that makes sense. That's kind no, of like, that totally it's makes very sense. distributed I, I, viewpoint. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, yeah. No, I, I mean, um, and I, I, I was just literally, if you saw my eyes sort of like, like focusing there, I was like, oh my God, we didn't talk about, we'd, the hour is almost up and we didn't talk about social inbox, which sounds like fascinating, but that's fine because that's just an excuse to drag you all back in when that ships. But if people want to find out more about distributed press and what you're doing, uh, what's, is it, what's the best place for them to, to join you? Yeah, probably easiest place is to follow the compost account on Mastodon. Mm -hmm. um, or I think it's linked from compost.digital if you look on there. Uh, we do also have a matrix channel where we're kind of inviting collaborators over time. If you want to work with us, uh, send an email to, I think, hello at haifa.coop. I think we might have a hello at distributed.press, but I'm not sure. Sent to both maybe? I don't know. Yeah. <laughs> um, <laughs> Yeah, yeah. Well, know, well, know, well you can set up an both. alias, I think, like, yeah. while we wait. Yeah. So, and, that, and, yeah. Mm -hmm. That's kind of where, um, obviously, slide into my DMs if you want. Um, I'm move at mastodon.move.moe um, on the Fediverse. Um, I'm on Twitter and stuff like that. I think we have a Twitter presence for compost as well, but um, it'd be nice if we used more decentralized stuff like email. Yeah. <laughs> Um, yeah, I also want to add that uh, docs.distributed.press is available if you are interested in self-hosting uh, distributed press for you or your own community as well. Um, and yeah, if you need any support with getting that up and running. Also and Fano, if anybody wants, if anybody would like their handheld and have a service for them to not only be on the disk decentralized web but also the the old-fashioned web um how do they how do they reach out to study well they can um send us an email to anything at suti.nl or suti.cop.ar um we can we can chat over email um there are also contact address, several contact addresses on our website who we already mentioned all right see you all on email out there um and um uh if you have any uh questions about um uh, what you've seen here uh, you can drop us a mail too we can be your intermediary um or if you have any suggestions for folks what we should talk about um we're always on the lookout for people not only to chat but also to support as FFTW and the Filecoin Foundation uh, do our work to uh, help uh, rise all the boats on the decentralized web. Thanks very much. Uh, I guess join and subscribe. I don't know. Um, and uh, we'll we'll see you next time. All right. Thanks a lot, everyone. Thank you.